today, as we usually do on a Friday, we're going to watch scenes of a movie where characters, their behaviors, the themes in the story are relevant for our examination of what is Machiavellian. So, once again, we're going to apply the main concepts that are introduced in this class to a famous movie, much more famous than the one <coughs> we watched during the last two weeks, The Godfather, part one. It's a movie from 1972. The director is Francis Ford Coppola, the screenwriter and the writer of the novel on which the film is based is Mario Puzo, who lived on Long Island during the luckiest part of his life and career when he was not in California writing screenplays because he didn't just write screenplays for The Godfather, he wrote the first Superman with Christopher Reeves and other screenplays. The story itself takes place on Long Island at least part of the time. It's between New York City and the vicinity of Long Beach, where the Corleone family, one of the mafia families in New York, and according to the story in the book and the movie, has a compound, a villa with a wall around, with a park, and of course a well-guarded compound. At the beginning of the movie, oh by the way, the movie came out in 1972, in 1973 at the Oscars. He was nominated for six Oscars, actually seven, but the nomination for the music score was withdrawn because the music was not entirely original. Ennio Morricone, who was a great Italian composer, had used some of the soundtrack for a previous Italian movie from the 1950s. Of the six nominations, the movie won three, got three awards, three Oscars. Marlon Brando got Best Actor, and the movie also got Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Picture. It was a huge success also commercially and went on, of course, uh, to uh, be repeated into two sequels to form the Godfather trilogy and all the three movies were successful. They're still uh, being sold on, on streaming platforms, DVD, etc. It is still a classic. In fact, you can say that it relaunched the crime movie. It created a genre that was widely imitated especially through the 1980s and the 1990s. During the 1960s, the crime movies that were successful at the ticket office more or less followed this kind of um, structure. It showed a group of criminal experts, each one the best in his field, who are trying a big heist, a big robbery, and that was supposed to require very complex skills, complex planning, a lot of hard work, a lot of commitment, and then after this big heist, the dream for the criminals involved in it was to retire and have a peaceful life integrated into society. That is to say, instead of making crime movies into dramas, as it was common during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, with some moralistic undertones, right? With some dramatic endings, because believe it or not, Hollywood produced a lot of great movies during the 30s, 40s, and 50s without a happy ending. Now it's hard to find a good drama that has a real dark, dramatic ending. But during the 1960s, the kind of criminal movies that I described 
establish the basis, the premise for the empathy between the spectators and the characters by suggesting that these, these criminals are not beasts, are not violent, instinctive individuals. These are high level professionals in their fields who could not have a career, but really on the screen display qualities that match the professional qualities of someone with a successful career. As I said before, commitment, focus, expertise, exact execution of a plan, okay? Then the conclusion, of course, was rarely the peaceful enjoyment of the fruits of their crimes. Usually something went wrong, and most of the criminals died, and only one or two survived and went on to continue with their lives, or all of them were killed, injured, put in jail. The Godfather created a completely new genre because it showed mafia criminals not primarily as criminals, but primarily as family men, as individuals who had a family they cared very much for, and who found themselves, because of the circumstances in their lives, this would be the Godfather part two and the story of Don Vito Corleone in Sicily, and then as a young man in New York City, where Don Vito Corleone is played not by Marlo Brando because you need a younger actor and De Niro is, is brought into the movie. So, men who, because of the circumstances in their lives, found themselves in a situation where, in order to protect their family and the interests of their family, had to turn into What's at play here is one of the pillars of the social ideology of Mario Puzo, who, after the success of the novel The Godfather, went on to write other novels, of course, and some of them were turned into movies, but also wrote several articles where he explained his deep conviction that some of the leaders of organized mafia of, of the Italian American and Italian or Sicilian criminal organizations really possessed authentic leadership skill. However, they were subject to discrimination in American society because of their ethnic background. They wouldn't have access to universities, to school of business, to uh, schools and colleges of business, to a managerial career, and therefore they had to turn to organized crime to be able to deploy and take advantage and the rewards, also enjoy the rewards, of their talents. And if they had not been discriminated, they could have contributed in a much more positive way to American society. So, Keep that in mind. At the beginning of the movie, we are in the last, during the last months of 1945. The war is just ended, right? And the family, the Corleone family, is in their compound near Long Beach, where in the garden outside the house, they're celebrating the marriage of Don Vito Corleone's daughter, Connie, with a civilian, with someone who's not a mafioso. And in fact, someone who probably doesn't even understand that the Corleone family is one of the powerful mafia families running different kinds of business in the city, including prostitution, gambling, and a, a racket, where, whereby you extort money from shops and various kinds, restaurants and various, various other kinds of business. 
it's a joyous occasion, a lot of guests, even important guests. Of course, the FBI is outside the compound, writing down the license plates of the cars, which reflects what was going on during that time. There would be meetings of mafia chiefs in fancy hotels or similar compounds, and the mafia would be, uh, the, the, the FBI would be outside writing down the license plates. They couldn't do much, but at least they tried to track those individuals and their connections. There are photographers, there is music. However, most of the time, the focus on the segment we will watch is on the inside of the house, the dark office, dark because the blinds are almost closed, of Don Vito Corleone, who's dressed very elegantly, of course, for the occasion, and who's listening, receiving some of the guests who are friends of the family, and listening to their issues and complaints. Something that is based on real life, of course, Puzo had some first-hand experience of what the Mafia did in New York. For example, he was familiar, he based the character of Don Vito Corleone on Carlo Gambino, who was a famous Mafia chief uh, of the time, and he knew, Mario Puzo knew, that Carlo Gambino, on a regular basis, several times a month, would open his office to members of the outside Italian American community who would come in and ask for favors and explain what issue they had that American society, New York City, New York State, the federal government was not able to address. And Carlo Gambino, depending on the case, would promise to use his influence to help them. This is also the case for the initial scene of the Godfather. Keep in mind, it is very significant that you start with a marriage. You don't start with a war. You start with a marriage, a war or a robbery or any other display of violence. In particular, you should focus your attention on the following characters who come <coughs> into Leon's <coughs> office. Salute and explain their situation and request in different ways the attention of Don Vito Corleone. You have the character of Bonasera, the first one, who's a tailor, I believe, or, or not. Well, forget <laughs> it. Uh, he, uh, the uh, uh, prospective father-in-law, a baker, who's coming to ask or an intervention for a young Italian who was brought in as a prisoner and now fell in love, has fallen in love with the baker's daughter, and the name of this young fellow is Enzo. Then you have Luca Brasi, and you understand right away who Luca Brasi is, and Michael Corleone, Al Pacino will explain also who he is. Then you have Johnny Fontaine, a singer, of course, this character is based on what famous Italian-American singer of the time. It's exactly all the details match in references, the references to the career of this character, trying to move from a singing career to a film career when, during time when he has problems with his voice. Sinatra? Frank Sinatra, exactly. So, they come, they ask for help, they receive some attention and the, the adjudication, the judgment, and uh, the, the feedback of the godfather, Don Vito Corleone, and then the rest of the marriage is a celebration of a joyous occasion for the family. After the marriage, we will also watch what happens later, and in just a few words, so that you can better follow the plot, the mafia family run by Don Vito Corleone is approached by a guy named, named Solozzo, 
uh, who's working with another family, the Tatalia, and they want to start a drugs business, importing drugs from Europe and the Middle East. They need from Don Vito Corleone one million dollars to set up the operation, and more importantly, they need his connections, his the help, the support, the blind eye of his powerful friends, who should ensure that the players involved in this drug operation are not persecuted and investigated, persecuted, put in jail. Don Vito refuses to, be, to engage in this kind of operation because he follows the traditional tenet uh, of the good mafia culture. Uh, don't get involved with drugs because drugs are immoral, because drugs are having a powerful negative effect on society. Of course, the mafia has always been involved in drugs. The New York Mafia was involved in drug trafficking ever since the 1920s. And this is very much part of the internal as well as external mythology of the Mafia. We know, for example, from the confessions, the memoirs written by Tommaso Buscetta in collaboration with journalists, uh, that he also knows that this is what is being repeated inside the Mafia. We don't do drugs, among other things. Uh, when, when in fact, <laughs> that is one of the businesses constantly uh, engaged in by mafia family, okay? But Don Vito Corleone says, no, good luck. Our business, our business interests are not in conflict, so good luck to you, etc. Of course, Solozzo doesn't take it well. Solozzo also will see that Sonny, James Kahn, one of the uh, sons of, and, and the first son, the heir to the empire, the heir to the empire of Don Vito Corleone, is not in agreement, would like to do this kind of operation. So Solozzo kills Luca Brasi, who's the muscle of the organization, the primary killer for uh, Don Vito Corleone. They try to kill Don Vito outside of his New York office while he's buying some fruit from a fruit vendor on the street. They shoot him and hit him five times, he's taken to a hospital, and survives. Michael, who's just returned from war, and in fact at the marriage we see him in a military uniform, and who's the uh, uh, younger, the youngest uh, uh, son of Don Vito Corleone, who has three sons and a daughter, the, the sons are Sonny, Fredo, and Michael, Michael, of course, goes to find, to visit his father at the hospital, and he finds the hospital completely empty. In a beautiful scene, because really, one, one of the strongest suits of the style of Coppola is the interior scenes. Uh, you'll notice a great difference between the interior scenes, which are shot beautifully in terms of photography, camera angles, and the outside scenes of the marriage or the outside scenes in New York City or outside the hospital, which are kind of flat and conventional. But in this beautiful scene, he goes around the hospital, no one is there. And his father is left completely alone. Because of course, someone has removed any escort, both police escort and also the mafiosi who are guarding their chief because someone is coming, a killer is coming to kill Vito Corleone, to, to finish what they started. And Michael, you'll see, will have to start doing something, finally, for his family. Michael had been excluded from the family business, the core business of the family, although he knows what the core business is. And Michael will start doing and finally, the police will come. And the very first act of violence that we see at the end of this first segment of today, and then next Friday we'll watch another one, but the very first act of violence is a policeman hitting Michael. So a policeman abusing his authority and hitting heavily on the face 
the one member of the court of family who's done nothing uh, criminal and who's in fact a war hero, a, a perfect American, someone who would be able to perfectly integrate in American society, someone who's, who has a university degree, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So I'm going to try something different. I'm going to distribute uh, two pages uh, for your note taking during the film because I want to read and hear afterwards your reaction. So in here you find space for today's date, then you put your name, it says name or names because in the past I would do this in groups, but now we'll do it as an individual activity as per COVID policies. And then you have space in the first page and the back for your notes and ideas. And I want you to try and track the following. In terms of power, in reference to what we said about the various forms of power, what is the significance of the scenes with Bonacera and the, 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 the father-in-law of Enzo the Baker, Luca Brasi, John de Fontaine. What forms of power are demonstrated during those scenes or referred to or alluded to? Then I want to also focus your attention on the scene setting. What is the significance of the mise-en-scene, of the fact that we see for most of the initial part, the office of Don Vito Corleone. How is it dressed? What is he doing during the scene while he's talking to these various guests? Finally, I want you to try and write something about Michael Corleone Al Pacino. What is the narrative arc of this character during the initial 20 minutes of the film? What are the changes that we see? And then, the next thing is just a generic invitation to write down any short phrase that you find significant in reference to the intellectual framework that we've been exploring in regards to Machiavelli's ideas and our interpretation of Machiavelli. Doesn't have to be perfect in all ways, right? You, you might not be able to uh, complete the list because you're trying also to follow the movie. You don't have to write a lot in reference to forms of power. We're looking for terms such as force, deterrence, influence, authority, right? That would be enough. So write Bonacera and then write that, or a simple sentence combining Bonacera the scenes with Bonacera and the form of power that we see in there, right? Same for quotes from the movie. I'm, I'm not expecting you to write dialogues, just short quotes that you find significant and that you, you can uh, quickly memorize and write down. In reference to the scenes, even if you write a few notes, that's enough and then at least some of you will be able to express their full uh, thoughts and comments uh, during the discussion that follows, okay? So just take one, I'll distribute the packets that in Christina, and uh, once everyone has the pages, we will start with the movie. Meanwhile, I'll set it up. And I raised the color in the American fashion. And what you hear is the beautiful music by Ennio Morricone, one of the greatest composers of the 20th century really innovative in his use of popular music, combining popular music with classical music in a very innovative, imaginative way. Although he also 
overproduced himself. He, he never said no to a contract, so that's why he sometimes recycled music from a minor movie to a major movie, etc. 